Bonjour, good morning. Welcome to this very early start this morning on the session on Asia, Asia's strengths and weaknesses. We have six very prominent experts, speakers to address us this morning. They come from a wide variety of background, from government, from business, from think tanks, and I'm sure they have a lot to share with us. I would like in the very brief introductory remarks, say that Asia presents both geoeconomic and geopolitical challenges for the region and for the world. But at the same time, Asia also opens up vast opportunities. We are on the cusp of an Asia century, and I think the projections, economic projections, have clearly shown that Asia is where growth will be in the century, and that the vast potential that Asia has should be an opportunity for European companies to look at. It has been projected that US growth of 2.5% and coupled with Asia's growth of 6.2% will imply that US will have US 400 billion growth a year, Asia will have US 1,000 billion growth a year. What this means when we add it up all is that Asia will create a new Germany every four years. I think that's a major trend, a very major impact that many of us have not really uh, taken into account. China will be able to generate sustained growth of seven to eight percent a year. The ASEAN countries will grow at five to six percent. Japan probably three to four percent. And overall, for the next three to four years, Asia would grow between five to six percent. However, I think many of us do not see Asia as a monolithic entity. Many people seem to think that it's one Asia and Asia is the same, but Asia is not. I think Asia is, like Charles Dickens put in his book, The Tale of Two Cities, a two Asia. We have one prosperous Asia that is growing very rapidly. We have also a poor Asia that is lagging behind. And I think these are some of the issues and challenges the panel will probably be speaking about. Uh, before I hand over to the panel, let me very quickly summarize perhaps what I think would be the key issues facing Asia. And I would say that these are the five eyes that Asia have to confront. The issues of inequalities, issues of infrastructure development, inclusive growth, integration, and investments. And these are the five eyes issues that Asia has to grapple with. Ladies and gentlemen, I now hand over to the panel. Each of the panelists would be given about seven minutes to make their initial presentations, and then we will have our open interactive discussion. In the first instance, I'd like to now invite our first speaker, Mr. Bruno Lafon, Chairman and CEO of Lafarge. So good morning, thank you very much. Uh, Lafarge is a, an international company with French origin, so we, have, uh, we are the leader in um, cement manufacturing all over the world, and Asia is representing now 20% of our sales, and uh, that was zero uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we are in most uh, important countries of Asia present. You know that cement is a very local business, so uh, when I travel to Asia, and I, I do five to six trips a year to Asia, for now 15 years, uh, I'm seeing a, a very small circle because we are selling 200 kilometers around our plants and it's in general not in the main city of the country. So I'm seeing many things that nobody never sees. And, uh, and I, I'm meeting, each time I'm meeting with uh, uh, our employees and our customers which are not you know, living in five-star hotels and uh, which are struggling. So and I've seen many evolutions in the past uh, and so the first thing I want to confirm is that it's not one Asia. Uh, there are several places, in many different places, if starting with China, continuing with India, and even when you look at Indonesia, uh, there is not, no one place in Indonesia. There are many, many different places. And, uh, and 
it's therefore it's difficult to, to, to speak about overall weaknesses of Asia uh, because the, it is so different. And uh, I will uh, just uh, try to focus on the strengths I'm seeing in Asia and the strengths uh, are not just, you know, uh, situations but also dynamics which are, which are very strong. For me, Asia is very similar to the rest of the world for on, on, on several very, very basic things. Strong local cultures, like everywhere, but very strong and very local. Uh, strong environmental challenges, and then I'm speaking about industry, but environmental challenges are as strong in Asia as anywhere in the world. Strong weight of bureaucracy, so uh, Asia is not, uh, uh, yeah, there is a, no paradise on, on the bureaucracy and Asia is not a paradise. So there are differences between states, but it's the same, uh, I would say, almost everywhere. What Asia also is almost sharing with, despite some differences, but uh, in Asia, labor is cheap uh, and energy is expensive. So that's uh, something which is, is the only one economic uh, assessment I will make. But what we see is that Asia is rising, as you said, and uh, 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 what is very interesting to see is uh, uh, the development of the cities in Asia. Uh, I'm, uh, I think the most important trend in Asia, what's happening today, and which is very strong, and which is very well managed, uh, and especially probably better than in many other places in the world, is urbanization. Urbanization is very critical, it's happening very quickly, and, uh, and it's uh, an enormous challenge to which you know, we are an important part because there is no city without concrete and uh, trying to innovate on concrete and to bring cities uh, housing for poor people and uh, uh, very big infrastructure requiring all the last uh, innovations on concrete are exactly uh, the type of challenge. Each time I'm landing in Calcutta, uh, Kolkata, I'm enjoying the trip, you know, between the airport and the center of the city. And each year I have seen a change. Or I would say during the five first year there was not too many change. But since five years there is a huge change. First year it was cleaner. Second year you started to see cranes. Third year you're starting to see, I don't know, a tramway or a highway. And the highway was done, you know, with cement bags at the beginning, at the end it was done with many other things. So, it's a, it's a tremendous change and I think it's very important. So uh, I think uh, what is interesting is uh, that Asia is, uh, is, uh, has a fabulous uh, strength. So be, be, be besides cities, I want to speak about the people. Uh, the people they share in Asia for me, the first, it's a learning population. They want to learn, they are eager to learn. We have 60,000 employees. We have a strong network, a lot of best practices everywhere they can access. The most, you know, hungry are the Asian people. The biggest, you know, uh, number of access, you know, are coming from our people in Asia. And the last, you know, to get in has been European and Americans. Uh, but Asian has been first to try to learn, and that's what we see. The learning curve is extremely, education systems are excellent. I don't know who said that uh, South Korea had the best education system in the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's very promising. These people are optimistic, they believe in growth. All my discussions, and I have a lot of meetings you know, with employees and young employees, <coughs> are asking me when do we do the next capex, the next investment, the next growth, how do we become the biggest? And they are just dreaming to be the biggest because they are eager to, you know, to grow. And they are ambitious, but at the same time they are pragmatic. I have seen them for the crisis they had. And uh, I think during the crisis, they have been also very, very pragmatic. I attending a group of uh, Asian businessmen meeting, it was in uh, Vietnam, uh, at the beginning of the financial crisis. And the way those very important people were looking at the crisis coming was very, very in interesting for, for a Western uh, uh, businessman uh, that I was. And the last point I want to say about the strengths is the speed. The speed. Uh, in, in Asia is different. Uh, it's, uh, and, and, and I would not differentiate one country to another. Of course, they are not exactly the same in every sector and in every, every place. But the speed is something fascinating in Asia. The speed with which people are, re are able to mobilize themselves and also to achieve things is, uh, is uh, tremendous. So I think it's, 
what I wanted to, to, to say about the strength. Uh, of course, we have uh, the best, and you can find the best in Niger. You can find the best uh, companies. I have seen, I have said, you can find the best uh, cities. You can start the best uh, level of growth in living standards uh, 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 growth. You know, I think in in a, in, a, in a lifetime you can you can raise your living standard by a thousand times. In of course, it is not maybe the case in Japan, but I would speak about the average Asia. What I like also is the, is the fact that all Asian societies are, are trying to implement the seven pillars, you know, free market economy, mastery of science and technology, meritocracy, pragmatism, culture of peace, rule of law, and education, which are all the things which are extremely good from a business point of view, you know, to develop a business. And I think that's also a very strong uh, 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 f strength of, of, of Asia because, because there is a, a uh, a, a common uh, will to progress and to and to learn about that. So it's very inspiring to my company. I learned a lot in Asia, and I'm going to Asia not just to manage but to learn. And uh, the, the, for me, there are two questions: uh, Will this uh, uh, generate a, a, a type of new global leadership, uh, economic-wise or culturally, also e political? And if yes, uh, what will be the and I, I'm very curious about the answers I could get on this question. What could be the values which are carried by Asia as a, as a global? Because there is no leadership without values. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lafon, for your perspective. <laughs> you are probably one of the very few French businessmen that visits Asia regularly, and hence you have got a very in-depth understanding of challenges and issues that Asia faces. May I now invite our next speaker, Mr. Narayanan, who is governor of West Bengal, but also the former National Security Advisor of India. Mr. Narayanan. May I speak now? Yes, sure. <laughs> it's a privilege to address this distinguished gathering and also to be with members of this very distinguished panel. Thank you, Mr. Montbrial, for inviting me to the session. Just now, both the moderator, Mr. Michael Yeo, and Mr. Lafont talked of two Asias. I also would talk about two Asias, but slightly differently. We have two Asias, both competing for space and attention. Economically, as we just heard from Mr. Lafont, and I must say, I'm so happy being a nation to hear what he had to say about Asia. Economically, we have a dynamic and to an extent inter integrating Asia. In security, in security terms, however, there is another Asia that appears to most people dysfunctional, buffeted by powerful nationalism and prone to irredentism. As we all know, Asia's strength lies in its burgeoning economy and I think this has been repeatedly referred to yesterday and even this morning. I, I, I would rather concentrate today on the so-called weaknesses of Asia rather than on its strengths, because I think the strengths are obvious. The Asian Development Bank, for instance, has said by, by 2050 or even earlier, Asia will nearly double its share of the global GDP to 52%. 53% of Asia's trade is now conducted within the region itself. The over US dollar 19 trillion economy has now become an engine of growth. So that's obvious and a lot more will be said on this during the course of this discussion. My point is that Asia security as compared to Asia econ econ economic appears anachronistic. And there are several reasons for this. <clears throat> the term Asia's weakness is, I think, maybe a little too strong. I would rather say that there are a lot of con concerns and problems in Asia that lead to the possibilities of its weaknesses. Among the concerns to begin with are that Asia is embroiled in several territorial disputes. The long-standing border dispute between India and China is one. 
For another, there are many undetermined and contested claims regarding the sea. The most serious of these, most serious of these are those spurred by China's ever-widening maritime claims in the South China and the East China Sea. The latest is China's designation of its air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, signaling that China wants to change the existing status quo. Third, China's constant assertion of its right to its historic waters, confined within the nine dash lines of Chinese claims, as also its insistence that not only its self-defined core interests be acknowledged by other powers in the region, but they accept its preeminent position in this part of the world. These are the concerns. Some are real, some are perhaps perceived. But most importantly, Asia confronts numerous problems, many of which I think have long-term consequences and implications, and many will probably affect Europe and the rest of the world in the not too uh, foreseeable future. First, there are problems arising from the rapid spread of fundamentalist, extremist, and radical ideas and beliefs. Across Asia, there is a resurgence of new radical outfits leading to religious extremism. We heard a lot of this yesterday evening, and I would like to stress this point once again. I would like to underscore the fact that religion, ethnicity, asymmetric warfare techniques, politics of migration of populations across borders, demands for inclusive policies and elimination of inequality today have replaced all the previous isms that were there. And therefore, we are facing a whole new host of problems present in Asia today, but likely to affect large parts of the world in the coming years. Religious and religious, uh, religion and religious strife are in a sense, the 1,000 pound gorilla in many of our drawing rooms in Asia today. Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, apart from West Asian nations like Egypt, Syria, and Tunisia, and the Gulf King Kingdoms, are all wrestling today with the problem of containing hardline Islamist groups. In turn, and this is the frightening part, many are seeking a symmetrical support from units like the Hezbollah and the Al-Qaeda, depending on their predilections. <coughs> we heard so much about S Syria yesterday. All I have to say is that Syria confronts an alphabetic super problems from the crumbling Free Syrian Army and ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Shams, to Jabhat al-Nusra and Aharat al-Sham, to Zeran al Army of Islam, all battling for control. The specter of Iran and a violent Shia-Sunni conflict hovers in the background. Asymmetric warfare and terrorism constitute a grave threat across Asia. Both Afghanistan and Pakistan are saddled with a combination of state weakness and the presence of myriad terrorist groups. This is further compounded in Pakistan's case by their employment of terror groups as a strategic instrumentality to keep countries in its neighborhood like India off balance. Also unsettling are some of the new army doctrines that Pakistan has revealed, which, stip which stipulates disproportionate response to future wars. I think a mild euphemism for resorting to nuclear weapons and insulate the countries from its high-risk strategy of supporting jihadi terrorism. Unsettled conditions prevail in many other parts of South, Southeast, and East Asia. Myanmar, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka are caught in a new cycle of strife involving religion, ethnicity, and politics. The color of Thailand's revolution and turmoil is as yet unclear, but turmoil there certainly is. The Maldives faces strong possibilities of consolidation of Islamist forces. Nepal faces a constitutional gridlock. Sri Lanka confronts both a political as well as an ethnic crisis. China-Japan differences have greatly exacerbated of late. India may be one of the more stable conditions, sta sorry, stable nations in, a in the Asian region. But while it does not face any existential threat externally or internally, 
It is privy to many of the problems and issues that I've said just now. It's therefore a matter of concern for us that if such problems increase across the region, we will also be badly affected in India. There are two other aspects of security which I think I need to stress here. One is the maritime and the other is the nuclear. Sea lanes of communication have, are critically important for Asian nations since almost 80 to 90% of all goods transported to and from Asia are by sea. Deep seabed mining has recently emerged as a strategic issue and is becoming increasingly confrontationist. Asian nations have become conscious of the strategic potential of the oceans and each of them are suitably positioning themselves, particularly China and India. Strengthening their naval capabilities has the Im impact of leading to unintended consequences. Perhaps even more difficult are the presence of many nuclear states in this region. Some of these states do not have a well-defined nuclear doctrine or effective safety procedures. Some, like Pakistan, are enlarging the scope for use of nuclear weapons and experimenting with tactical nuclear missiles, signaling a shift in their strategy and raising the possibility of free delegation of nuclear weapons to battlefield commanders. I don't know, when I wrote this, I thought if the Iran deal was on, Saudi Arabia the, itself may take a, har a harder look at becoming a nuclear filament power. Before I conclude, I might add, concerns about Asia often center around the possibility of, con of a conflict between India and China, a consequence of the simultaneous rise in the same time frame of two countries living in close proximity to each other and both having very venerable cultures. Both China and India discount this kind of rivalry. Nevertheless, there are com concerns <coughs> and these stem from the fact that in China's case, nationalism is often seen as the main driver of China's foreign and defense policies. And this is one of the periods where Chinese policymakers have raised the ante of nationalism and Chinese academics are busy making out a case for Chinese exceptionalism. Also, apart from China's rapidly growing military capabilities, China's constant refrain of continued competition with imports in the military domain raises concerns and hackles of nations in its vicinity. India, eschews a policy based solely on power relations. India's concerns vis-a-vis -vis China are mainly the opaqueness of Chinese thought processes and the reasons given for China's action on India's periphery, including a resurgence of interest in areas on its southern and southwestern flanks, as also the steps taken by China to augment its strength in provinces such as Tibet, Xinjiang, and Yunnan. Given that the Chinese mind leans towards the contextual and relational, China's true intent remains unclear. Beyond this, however, I would like to stress that India is inclined to give China the benefit of the doubt. Finally, I would hazard that Asia's economic growth and expansion are clearly on an upward curve, and this should further enhance its geoeconomic importance. On the other hand, given the absence of a well-anchored regional security structure or a concert of nations in Asia on the lines of the concert of Europe in the 19th century, the presence of geopolitical upheavals, given the dysfunctional nature of security aspects in the region and the new threats cannot be ruled out. We therefore have a balance sheet which is, I think, tilting towards the negative rather than the positive. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Governor Narayanan, for your list of the security challenge and geopolitical problems facing Asia. I'd like to invite now our next speaker, Mr. Jin Ryu from Korea, to address us. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jin Ryu, Chairman and CEO of uh, Pungsan Corporation. 
Our main business is uh, non-ferrous metal and also defense. Uh, Two of the products that we make are, we make 60% uh, of all the world's uh, coin blanks, and we also uh, export quite a bit of ammunition. So we know which countries are doing uh, well, making money, and we know which countries are not doing well, uh, going to war. <laughs> so those are two of my uh, business. So first, uh, I'd like to start by talking about the strengths and weaknesses of Asia in general, and then conclude by talking about Northeast Asia, which includes China, Japan, North Korea, and South Korea, where it's, uh, part of our, my, uh, uh, we live. Obviously, uh, like the Deputy Minister of Turkey said yesterday, with more than half of the world's population centered in Asia and still growing, the future of global economic growth will be concentrated in Asia. And that is why the United States of America a few, few years back said they were pivoting to Asia. Although I think the word pivot was the wrong word to use, it sounds as though Asia is much more important than other parts of the world. But what can, you, what can you say? Typical American phenomenon of using fancy words, not thinking about the impact, uh, negative impact of such words. Uh, not only half of the world's population is in Asia, but most of the economic growth is also concentrated in Asia, <laughs> where countries like China, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, and even countries like Philippines are uh, achieving uh, tremendous economic growth. With both the population and economic growth, Asia will continue to dominate as a manufacturing base from high-end industrial goods to low-end staple goods such as agricultural and textile goods. It will also be the biggest market for high-end goods, from airplanes to all kinds of luxurious goods. There are more millionaires and billionaires coming out of China and other Asian countries than any other part of the world. So Asia will continue to be the biggest exporters as well as the biggest importers of all kinds of goods. That is the good news and the strength of Asia. And now to the bad news and the weakness of Asia. <laughs> with the tremendous, with the tremendous uh, population and economic growth, Asia cannot handle all the environmental and social issues that comes with it. For example, the pollution and air quality in China, especially in Beijing, is so bad that it is not only a Chinese problem, but it is also beginning to affect the air quality of Korea. When the winds are strong uh, during the winter time and springtime, all that bad uh, air comes uh, uh, to Seoul and uh, to my country. It's so bad that I'm thinking about getting another um, house somewhere uh, 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 else, uh, other place in the world, and Monaco is not a bad place to uh, get another house, I think, so I'll seriously think about it. Uh, also, uh, Asian countries uh, that are poor have no ability to control any kind of environmental problems, and in addition, they have too many social and basic human rights problems such as abuse of women and children's rights, problems such as, uh, as uh, again, children's rights leading to human trafficking for sex and also inhuman working conditions for underage children. Corruption is another issue, um, uh, but I see things uh, are improving in that end with the rise of democracy in uh, various of these countries. In addition, Asia recently went through some massive natural disasters such as the typhoon in the Philippines, and then the big tsunami a few years ago in Japan, that would take a long uh, time to uh, recover. I think one of the Asia's uh, major uh, weaknesses is that Asia does not have a strong leader or a control power like the United States in the case of North, South, and uh, Central and South America. And in the case of Europe, you have the European Union that in some cases you reach out uh, to African countries. China and Japan could certainly play that role but as China becomes more powerful and richer, they seem to be getting greedier, trying to control everything, including the airspace. Whereas Japan is trying to increase their military strength without acknowledging their neighbors about what they did wrong in the past. In some ways, they still think they are the victims of World War II instead of the aggressor. And in the case of my country, Korea, we suffer from what I call Korean Alzheimer's. We forget all the good things that happened between our neighbors, but only remember the bad things and the grudges. I always say you can change your wives, but you cannot change your neighboring countries. So you might as well do your best to get along. And finally, you have North Korea, which is completely another planet. How many leaders in the world will execute his, uh, execute his uncle? So Asia, despite all its opportunities uh, and great future, have many problems to deal with. And we cannot solve these problems alone. 
I think the European Union could be a good model for Asia so that we can bond together during good times and bad times. But could we create a uh, union like what you have here? Je ne sais pas. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Jin Ryu, for your perspective. May I now invite Ambassador Hoshima? Thank you very much. Um, I come from Japan. Uh, listening to yesterday's uh, interventions, uh, some people are talking about demography. Uh, inevitably, we were referred to as a declining uh, country. Uh, maybe eventually we'll be banishing, but we haven't banished yet. I'm, uh, I'm here to pre prove that. And, but in the context of the declining uh, labor force, uh, abenomics uh, is trying to have uh, in, uh, increase in the labor participation rate, having women start to work uh, more, and trying to uh, use elderly people who should be retiring but still working. That's why I'm here. Uh, but when I go back to Tokyo and say uh, I've been working in Monaco, uh, the trouble is people will not believe me. Having said that, uh, if I I should, I, I do not want to, you know, many people have uh, expressed uh, a very broad view of Asia and what it has as weaknesses and strengths. Let me just try to be very concrete, specific on some of the uh, issues that concerns us. And I put it in three A's, not three I's, I'm sorry, but A, Abenomics, uh, ADIZ, and uh, uh, Asia in the context of global security. Abenomics, I won't go into detail, because you know the detail if you read the Finance Times series of uh, articles in the past few days. This one make one message, and that is that, what is the message of Abenomics? Now, the jury is still out, as somebody had said, or it's always being said, but the most important part is Mr. Abe brought the case before the jury, which is the Japanese population, which is to say that people, look, you don't have to be bogged down in the deflationary mindset. We would change the atmosphere. We would change the outlook for the future. That is the inflation rate uh, uh, policies. And this is being successful. Now, th the third arrow, the structural reform, I won't go into detail. It's still coming uh, one by one. And, but the results will be still uh, uh, you know, out there to be de determined later, but the mood has changed. If you go to Tokyo and walk the streets of Tokyo, there's totally different, I, I say totally, but the atmosphere is quite positive. So now the question is when, how will this be uh, channeled into consumption and greater investment? Because during the deflationary mindset, people are now consuming, not investing. So people in Europe, we haven't vanished. Uh, we are now coming back on the radar screen. So look forward to the success of Abenomics. Second one, second day is ADIZ. Um, there has been already some references. I won't go in, uh, so let me just go into some detail. ADIZ stands for uh, Air Defense Identification Zone. The problem that China, Chinese ADIZ, quote unquote, is that it's not quite the ADIZs we have in Japan or others. There are a couple of very important and critical differences, but it's really a misnomer to call this an ADIZ. Two most important things that we are concerned about. One, uh, it has demanded that all aircraft flying in the airspace designated should notify the Chinese authorities. Not only those destined to China, but every aircraft flying in this uh, space. It, it comes with a threat. It says, if you don't obey our orders, uh, it doesn't say so specifically, but there's a hint that it could be shot down. And of course, all of us who live in this part of the world, unfortunately, remember what happened to KL-007, uh, which was shot down by a Soviet uh, interceptor in 83 or something like that. So all the civil aircraft will be very careful. Um, more importantly for us is the fact that it covers the airspace over Senkaku Islands. Now, we have our ADIZs for some years. 
because it, it has nothing to do with territorial claims, but only for some certain specific uh, purposes, our ADIZ do not cover the airspace of territories we claim that are administered by other governments, like the Northern Territories of the Soviet administered by Russia, and Takeshima administered by Korea. Senkakushu Islands uh, have always been administered by Japan, since has become part of Japan. Not only that, because of this fact, it's administered by Japan, it's covered by the US-Japan Security Treaty. So to have a ADIZ, or so-called ADIZ, covering these islands, airspace, with a threat is an obvious challenge to not only Japan, but the United States, and also the security status quo security structure we have. It's a huge challenge, and it should not be uh, dismissed as only uh, just technical uh, matter. Uh, it, has, it has to be uh, rescinded. Um, and um, if I may, just I don't want to go into detail, but if I may, uh, Chinese would say, well, but you, Japan, started all this by nationalizing, quote unquote, the Senkaku Islands. But I'm sorry, I don't think those people who use the so-called nationalization as an excuse understand the meaning of nationalization. This, if you have a government purchasing equity of uh, some corporation, 100%, 50%, whatever, you have the control, then it's called nationalization. What happened in Japan, with a certain political purpose, of course, to avoid the whole purchase of an island, uh, some of the plots being used by ultra-nationalists, the government purchased in order you know, to avoid that being the place being uh, a staging area for something un unacceptable. So, but, but it was only a transaction. It was a transaction of title of ownership of some of the plots, which means that we have a registry of uh, real estate, which have always been there, meaning that it's under Japanese effective administration. So nationalization has nothing to do with the sovereignty issue. It was, in fact, a political move tried to avoid the contest tenure situation. Um, so let's now move on to the whole question of uh, Asia in, in, in the global context. Yesterday, I was listening to uh, with interest, because I used to be uh, posted in the Middle East, the whole issue is uh, about the Middle East. But if I may say so, I was a bit worried that was struck by the fact that you people who are in, from Europe were saying, well, we, you have to do this. And all, there were all sorts of course, differences, but as if to say the security in the Middle East will not affect directly the European security. If you look at well, I, 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 I'm not going to talk about Middle East, but if you're talking about the East Asia, if I, or Asia, security there, the security issues enumerated already, will be affecting you, Europe, or the globe. If you remember, many of the people in Europe, in the, in the, if you are old enough to remember, in the 80s, there was a whole issue about the INF, the SS-20s and the Pershing twos. And there was an idea to move the SS-20s across the world towards east of the world. And we said in Japan, wait a minute, SS-20s are mobile. We may be avoiding some problems in Europe, but it's creating security problems in Japan. So the leaders got together in G7 said security is invisible. Likewise, what's happening in East Asia with the challenge of the security status quo structure will affect Europe. And, and there's also the linkage between the security and the economy, obviously. So another point I needed to, I should have said earlier what about the, the Chinese uh, so-called ADIZ is the lack of congruence with what China is trying to do on the economic front. 
It came at a time almost coincidentally with the third plenum. And of course, you all know have been following three, uh, third plenum. It has a very decisive uh, direction towards market economy, or reforms towards market economy. We all wanted it to succeed. We in Japan wanted it to succeed because it would be a very important impact on the world economy. But you, for, the, for these reforms to succeed, you need an international environment, political environment, conducive to such reforms for, so that FDIs and other economic exchanges would take place. We are not certain what the intentions are of, of, of having this kind of a security threat at a time when China has to focus on reforms. Um, I've spoken too much. Uh, I don't know what the future has in store for us. As somebody mentioned, uh, whether 2014 would be something like 18, 1914, uh, God forbid, but I don't know. Uh, but I'm all hoping uh, Asia will muddle through. At the moment, there's more muddling than throwing, uh, but I hope we will finally come through. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Oshima-san. May I now invite Mr. Tokunov from Russia to address us. He's also an expert on Korea. Thank you very much. I am from Russia, which is both uh, Europe and Asia, and we call ourselves uh, Eurasian nation. Uh, but I'll, I want to say a few words about the uh, issue, which has been attracted a lot of attention in recent days. It's uh, happened in such a way that I have followed the situation uh, in Korea for almost 40 years. And uh, I spent my junior years, uh, young years, as a junior diplomat in uh, the Soviet embassy in uh, Pyongyang. And since that time, I've visited uh, North Korea for many times. And the last one was uh, a little bit more than a year ago when I participated in the festivities dedicated to 100th anniversary of great leader uh, Kim Il-sung. So uh, I have dared to say that I know what is going on in Korea and even in the north part of this peninsula. Uh, but uh, frankly, uh, Korea, which is a very old international and Asian problem, but very, still very alive, is uh, bringing a lot of surprises and shocking news uh, to us, particularly from the northern part of the peninsula from the uh, so-called Hermit Kingdom. You know that Korea was called Hermit Kingdom in the Middle Ages, and North Korea is still the Hermit Kingdom, the, uh, the closest country in the world. And in recent uh, days, we were shocked by the news that the uh, closest relative and very strong supporter of Kim Jong Un, the young leader, uh, was purged and executed, as well as uh, a lot of his supporters uh, from the party system, as well as from the military. Uh, you know that uh, Kim Chun, uh, Chan Son Tech uh, was a husband of beloved sister of uh, Kim Chan Un uh, aunt and uh, beloved sister of Kim Chun Il and uh, the aunt of uh, Kim Chun Il. So both of them played a very important role in the uh, history and in the developments in Korea in uh, recent 20 or even more years. So elimination of Chan Son Tech and his supporters might have great con consequences as uh, Kim Chun Un uh, shows his cruelty and uh, unpredictability. His uh, aggressive posture in 2013 and psychological war aimed at the West to solidify his power and uh, force concessions out of the United States uh, causes great concern. Uh, initially, there were many hopes that the young Western educated leader, if we uh, take the uh, two years in 
uh, Swiss secondary schools as, uh, school as uh, Western education, of course, uh, might change the course of his country to a more pragmatic one. He gave such hopes thanks to PR actions aimed at increasing popularity with the somewhat skeptical population of the country. But uh, the initial push for changes uh, has stalled by the end of uh, 2012, and the question about possible changes in North Korea remains open. In uh, 2013, the hardline policies dominated both in internal uh, uh, politics where repressions were on uh, increase and in external policies where the inflammatory rhetoric and provocations were about. Can Kim Chun un leave these things as they are like the old part of the leadership wants? Geopolitical position of the country, the factor of South Korea, the strategic goal of which remains the absorption of North Korea, and the factor of China, which wants to control uh, the regime, does not allow experiments that endanger the security of the regime. The obvious recipe uh, are the conservation of the leadership and hopes to renovate the totalitarian monarchical political system. However, the penetration of information from outside and uh, the development of market relations has made it increasingly difficult. The population has uh, long lost faith in Chuche ideals and perceives propaganda as white nose, learned how to overcome prohibitions with help of bribes. So far, the regime keeps its stability simply because the authorities have for the first time left the population much alone to pursue their economic interests and personal life rather than participate in uh, collective efforts as long as the system is not challenged. The most vivid testimony is the emergence of so-called middle class initially in Pyongyang, uh, which uh, discovers new consumerism uh, for itself. The authorities try not to notice that and not to regulate new phenomena, it's uh, possible that younger part of leadership see this emerging class of owners and successful people as a new base for the regime and wants to count on their loyalty rather than sit on the bayonets. It could be reasonable uh, as this new class has something to lose in case of calamity and is afraid that in the case of regime change or unification, they would lose their social status and position. They do fear that any unrest may result in conquering of their country by South Korea, which is seen as hostile, and this does not uh, encourage demands for changes. At the same time, any criticism of authorities is still not tolerated, and the people which were given some uh, breathing space do not feel the acute need and are afraid to challenge the existing code of things as the repressive system of North Korea has the traditional feudal and then harsh colonial system at, as its direct predecessors, and the population simply is not aware of any form of government. But the fact, in fact, in order to maintain the North uh, Korean state as an independent state, the elite has to offer a new national idea and it should not be just survival by means of strengthening uh, military defense capabilities. It is relatively easy to refuse from important ideas of communism. The uh, word, the word itself, has already disappeared in 2009 from the constitution of North Korea, and the last portraits of Marx and Lenin were uh, gone from uh, Pyongyang streets. I witnessed it myself a year ago. The Tom uh, or our style socialism is elastic. Kim Il-sanism, uh, Kim uh, Johnnyism, more and more resembles the religious teachings. Remember that Confucius was a real person. There uh, may be different interpretations of um, uh, heritage. Uh, the economic reality of North Korea for a long time already is not Stalinism as uh, was often presumed in the past and uh, even now. Semi-paralyzed public sector exists 
side by side with quasi market gray and uh, marketized uh, international sector with the participation of economic entities belonging to the administrative, regional, party bodies, security services, and the military, as well as joint ventures, free economic zones, which in the last year have received a new development. As semi-state oligarchic economy is emerging, with a, uh, which in principle can become the backbone of the regime in the future. Uh, when we uh, speak about the Russian position towards uh, the situation on the peninsula, uh, we should emphasize that for Russia, stability and prevention of a conflict uh, at its eastern borders, which could lead to tectonic changes in uh, geopolitical situation, is the uh, outmost priority in its Korean policy. Unfortunately, it is questionable whether the goal of denuclearization of North Korea is attainable uh, for the moment. So any diplomatic process is only a tool to hedge the risks, stop North Korean improvement, its arsenal, and uh, prevent nuclear proliferation. The basic underlying theory of Russian policy makers is that the need for peaceful coexistence in Korean Peninsula. Of course, the relations of Russia with North and South are not equidistant, as some critics in South Korea say. Although there are uh, sharp divisions on the uh, Korea issue even within Russian uh, elites, liberals vis-a-vis uh, -vis communists and nationalists, but the policy is formed by the moderates, guided by the Russian-owned vision based on decades of analysis dating back to 19th century and 70-odd years interaction with North Korean communists. In principle, in the long run, a unified, friendly Korea state without any foreign dominance, uh, though sandwiched between China and Japan, could be a powerful balancer to Russia for being in the crucial Northeast Asian region. It would also uh, enormously help Russia's economy advance in Asia, and it could make Russia a significant player in energy sphere and logistics, as well as in reconstructing North Korea. Uh, therefore, Russia supports both inter-Korea reconciliation, reconciliation and eventual unification, except it costs. Peaceful unification, the only acceptable method to Russia, seem not to be on the agenda, and uh, a forceful absorption of North Korea by the South could be harmful both to Korean nations and regional security. Uh, at the same time, the collapse or soft landing of North Korea are not imminent, uh, as the third generation's power uh, transfer is going smoothly. Based on that, Russia cannot afford to quarrel with its neighbor, let alone press for its downfall, regardless of, of its uh, actual feeling towards the brutal North Korean regime. Uh, Russia stresses the need to engage Pyongyang, not because of warm feelings in Moscow towards the regime, or, uh, or because it's considered a, an important part of Russia advance in the East, but simply because this is essential for maintaining security in its uh, borders. Uh, but the agenda of diplomatic process should be comprehensive and not be concentrated uh, solely on North Korean nuclear problem, but uh, addresses all concerns, including that uh, of uh, the North Korea, of uh, normalization and normalization of relations of North Korea uh, uh, with its neighbors, I mean uh, Japan, I mean the United States. Uh, Russia called for multilateral approach to Korean issue, and uh, mm, the most urgent uh, issue on the agenda is to create a new peace and security management system in and uh, around Korean uh, Peninsula. How can such a system look like? It's obvious that strictly bilateral agreements on North Korean security related issues simply do not work. Take an example of South-North uh, agreements of 1992 and of 2000-2007 summit declaration, the United States-North uh, Korean 94 agreed framework, 
and Japan, North Korean declaration, etc. Thus, a durable peace regime should be a multilateral construction and include the chief actors related to the situation. In other words, Korea, China, USA, Japan, and Russia, as well as UN as the supervisor, should work on the package deal proposal that could be described by the formula peace for nukes. Well, I, I spent all my time, as I understand. Yeah, yeah, can we, can, thank you very much. Thank you. May we now have Mr. Yang from China to address us. Okay, uh, thank you. This is my first time when I got an invitation. Uh, it was called it is a conference on global governance. I was given the topic of the strength and the weakness of Asia. So as a scholar, I prepare my this talk from the perspective of both the strength and the weakness of Asia in the context of global governance. And I'm from Shanghai, not the capital. And I remembered 10 years ago for my first visit to India, my India friends encouraged me you Shanghai guys work hard. Maybe in 10, 20 years, you can catch up with Bombay. <laughs> uh, so now I would like to talk about how I look at the strengths and the weaknesses of Asia in the broader setting of global governance. I was born as an incurable optimism. I always look at things on the positive and the encouraging side. So I think Asia has its great strength in the following ways. Number one, it's a matter of course, the Asian's economic dynamism ever since the 19 50s and the 60s. Let's look at the G20. And I counted if we count China, India, Japan, ROC, and Indonesia, and the Russian, and the one volunteer tried to be a member of Asia, that's Australia, and also a uh, very much wanted to be a part of this region, the United States. The seven actors counted for 40%. Because of the limit of time, I won't go into detail. The second is the political strength. Asia is a region thirsty for learning. China inherits such a civilization, Confucius said, if three people taking a walk, they must be one to be my teacher. And some other civilizations or cultures different. They think if there are three people taking a walk, I must be the teacher. So in China, we can say, learn from India, from Japan, from the United States, sometimes not the other way around. And the third, the strength lies in the open regionalism. Looking around the world, there are only Asia that our regionalism is open. If you are not a European country, you cannot be a member of European Union. And if you are not a West Hemisphere country, you cannot be there as a full member. But for East Asia Summit, we can have India. That's from South Asia. We can 
have Australia and New Zealand. And in particular, we can have America, the United States. And this kind of open regionalism gives the strength rather than weakness to Asia. So in the post-World War II years, almost 70 years, Asia is constantly on the growth, development, from one echelon upgrading to a higher level of echelons. And also, there are more shared values coming together. I remember very well when Prime Minister of India, Mr. Singer, came to China, gave a talk, and the China Academy of Social Sciences, he said, Asia is large enough for both China and India to have common development. And during the 1997 financial crisis, and the same bold spirit became the order of the day. And then 10 years later, during the global financial crisis, a new norm of uh, thinking, that is, have consultations before, during, and after. So we had avoided a possible repetition of the Great Depression of 1929 to 1931. But as every coin has its other side, with these strengths, we have the weaknesses. First of all, there is much lack of regional awareness entities. And in Asia, people are talking about Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, and sometimes we think West Asia is belonged to the Middle East. And what is more, and the second problem is most obvious, the political and security issues. And uh, today we heard uh, so-called uh, China's expansionism and uh, China-Japan strife uh, and China and uh, ASEAN countries uh, disputes over some islands and the waters. And uh, of course, when Japan had the ADIZ 44 years ago, nobody was talking about that. When the, the United States was announced, it was not. But now, when China did anything, it became the headline of the world news. And our American friends told us, oh, buddy, you don't be fuzzy about that. We Americans always like that because you are growing. You're growing too fast. And now you have become the lime, in the limelight of the stage. And you have to bear all these attentions and the focuses. And also, the economic issues and the social problems, the inequality of distribution, and also that the Asian economy contributes a great deal, like 40% to the world growth, but Asia is still in the lower ladder of the economic decision making and the course of discourse, rights of discourse, rule making, agenda setting, etc. So Asia is an Asian continent and the rise and the emergence of Asia will be a long procedure process that we have to. But I think if I'm Chinese, I like traditional Chinese medical theory. According to that theory, you have to build up the positive side 
in building up the positive side, the negative side, the in proportion, would go down. If we focus on the positive energy, positive side, and learn from the United States, learn from Europe, learn from Africa, and to put every good part uh, withdrawing into uh, our own uh, makeup, and then sooner or later, we can reach. In concluding, if we look into the future, 50 years, 100 years later, and we compare the world wars gradually over the rural area for coal and steel. But if you think in a broader sense for cooperation, for win-win the end, then someday you would think, and these kind of things should be dealt in a more constructive way. So I think uh, I'd better stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. Before I open the floor for questions and discussions, let me just share some perspectives on Southeast Asia, the ASEAN countries of Southeast Asia. The 10 countries of the ASEAN nations has a combined GDP of US 2.2 trillion, a population of over 600 billion, and growth of 5.6% per annum. The ASEAN countries also have a very young workforce of 310 million people below the age of 30. Overseas trade for the ASEAN countries account for US 2.5 trillion. And these are some of the positive economic uh, indicators from ASEAN. What is perhaps a very strong point for the ASEAN countries is that the East Asia Summit that Mr. Yang referred to earlier has recognized ASEAN centrality, that ASEAN as an entity would be a key force in East Asia and, and the dialogue with the other East Asia partners. The, the ASEAN countries are now negotiating a, a new FTA called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or RCEP, that will combine ASEAN with China, India, Korea, uh, South uh, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And, and I think this would be something that is quite uh, important for the future growth in the region. On, on the other side, in terms of the challenges, uh, the ASEAN countries need to rebalance, and rebalancing in ASEAN, we need to focus on domestic consumption, regional integration, social inclusion, and sustainability. And ASEAN faces what I would describe as the three E's challenges, the ecological challenge, the, the problem of environmental degradation that some of the speakers have spoken about earlier, the challenge for education and human capital development to build the skilled workforce that we need to take ASEAN forward, and, and also the, the problem of employment because in, in the ASEAN countries over the last few years, we are experiencing a period of jobless growth where there is strong growth, but there's not enough employment generation. I think these are some of the challenges that ASEAN faces. I would now like to throw the floor open for questions. There's a person here, yes. Uh, could you please identify yourself? Thank you. I'm Michael Fullylove. I'm the director of the Lowy Institute in Sydney, Australia, which is a country with a European history but an Asian geography. And I'd like to ask the panel about the US role in Asia, which we touched on briefly, but, but, but let me put a, a, a provocation to the panel if I can. I think you've shown us that wealth and power are shifting eastward. The economic story is mainly a strength. The security story, as many of you talked about, is unpredictable. Uh, we heard from Mr. Tolkanov about events in North Korea in the last week. We heard from uh, Mr. Narayanan and Mr. Oshima and Mr. Young about tensions in the East China Sea since the Chinese declaration of an, uh, of an ADES. Um, I would make my own observation that Chinese foreign policy 
is somewhat uncertain. The future of Chinese foreign policy is uncertain. It's somewhat uneven. It's sometimes uh, predictable and sometimes unpredictable. And in this context, to me, the, re the American rebalance to Asia makes sense. It makes sense for America to be in Asia in strength. America needs to walk a fine line between reassuring its allies about its presence without emboldening them, stre projecting strength to China without projecting belligerence. But here's my provocation. It looks to me like the American pivot has run out of puff. US policymakers are still drawn to the Middle East like iron filings to a magnet. Secretary of State Kerry is an old style Atlanticist He's focused on bringing peace to the Holy Land, and I wish him much luck with that. Um, his first visit, of course, was to Western Europe and to the Middle East, whereas Secretary Clinton's first visit was to Asia. Indeed, Secretary Kerry is rarely seen in Asia, and when he's in Asia briefly, he's usually consulting uh, foreign ministers about what's happening in the Middle East. This is no doubt reassuring to European capitals and perhaps to Beijing, but it's not reassuring to US allies and friends in the United States. I think Obama is interested in Asia, um, but he's distracted. He's distracted by um, troubles abroad and by political dysfunction at home. And in fact, he can't even guarantee when he says that he's going to be at the East Asia Summit or the APEC leaders meeting that he's necessarily going to be there. The military elements, finally, of the rebalance are underwhelming. So to me, uh, the US role in bringing balance to the power structure in Asia is very important. But I am unconvinced about the staying power of this initiative. And I'd like the panel, and in particular perhaps Mr. Narayanan and Mr. Young, to, uh, to comment on whether the pivot has run out of puff. Thank you. Thank you. If, if I may, for, with the indulgence, take maybe two more questions, and we have three questions for the panel to answer at the same time. Yes. I'm from South Korea, former Minister of Foreign Affairs. We just heard uh, from our panelists two different images of Asia. The strong Asia with a lot of uh, great potentials become a growth of engine in the next generation. And the other image is uh, weak Asia with abject property and, and other tensions. But there's different angle. There is um, uh, interdependence among Asian nations are growing. But at the same time, tensions are also growing. In normal sense, when interdependence increases, the tension should decrease. But in, in the case of Asia, it's quite the opposite. So we call it as, uh, categorized as phenomenon as Asia paradox. And the new government of South Korea, under the leadership of President Park Geun-hye, uh, proposed a kind of multilateral dialogue process in order to solve this Asia paradox that is called Northeast Asia Security Peace and Cooperation Initiative. And my question goes to three panelists uh, who came from our three big neighbors, Japan, Russia, and China. How do you think about that proposal, the initiative, Northeast Asia Peace and Security Cooperation? Thank you very much. Thank you. One final question. That's a gentleman. Yes, uh, I'm the Iraqi ambassador to France, therefore I'm from West Asia. And uh, I have a question that addresses not the pivot to, to Asia that we've heard a lot about, but rather a pivot by Asia. And there are two incidents that make me think of this. One is the overwhelming presence of Asian companies, particularly Chinese companies, in the bid rounds that were carried out in Iraq in 2009 uh, for uh, concessions of, or, or, or service contracts to huge oil fields. Um, I think the Chinese came out uh, way on top. Uh, the other, uh, the other uh, element that, that makes bring this to my mind is a statement made by a uh, Indian general uh, at an IISS meeting at the Manama Dialogue a few years ago where he asserted the importance of the Gulf to uh, India as a national security interest because of the presence in particular of over five million Indian nationals there. So we've been talking about Asia in, in terms of the interests of the rest of the world, 
but it seems to me that Asia is interested in the rest of the world in being proactive there. Uh, could the panel address this, please? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm um, open to questions in the panel. There are three questions, pivot to Asia, the North Korea, I mean the North East Asia Peace Initiative and the relevance of the Gulf region. May I invite any of the panelists to respond? I think this. I think the second question is the easier one for us. That is the pivot by Asia. It's true. I think for definitely for India, West Asia, particularly the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and other countries are vital for two reasons. One is we have six million Indians present there. I think they have been useful, both for the countries they are working in and also for India in the sense that they have helped build bridges between India and, and this part of the world. Secondly, of course, the oil from this area is crucial for India's progress and growth. And that's why when, when you have problems with Iran and in other countries, it creates a lot of problems for, for India. So I, I think the Indians in, um, in Asia, I mean, sort of the Gulf and Saudi Arabia, I think have a factor of, been a factor of both stability as also in building bridges between the two countries. And uh, as I said, the oil that fuels our growth comes from this part. I mean, the, the majority of our oil supplies come from this region. So as far as, as far as we are concerned, we are particularly happy. I hope West Asia or uh, the Gulf and other countries are equally happy. I think they, they are. I, I shall leave the presence of Chinese companies there to um, a friend from, from China. But on the, the first question, on the US poet, poet towards Asia, I think the most important thing is a few years ago, if there was a US pivot towards Asia, it, most Asian countries would have resented it. There would have been a great deal of uh, upsurge against Ameri US colonialism or US imperialism or whatever you like to call it. I think the most important change that has happened in recent years is that this has been welcomed by most countries in, in the region. And particularly the smaller countries have been reassured by the so-called US towards, towards Asia. And I think there's a certain amount of concern, particularly among the so smaller countries, that the pivot has become rebalancing and whether the rebalancing is going to decline even further is, I think, a matter. Now, whether this is because of imagined concerns or whether they are based on real concerns, I think it might. We've just heard from the Chinese uh, representative that in a sense, I think the Chinese civilization is far more uh, able to adjust to these requirements as, a, as in another very ancient civilization we respect it. But I did try to bring out in my, that there are concerns that whether Chinese nationalism is becoming an issue of concern, particularly when you think now the Indo-Pacific region the Chinese are seen to be now emerging as a naval power, apart from their obvious strengths and many, many other factors. So it is in that context that to assuage such concerns, the US rebalancing towards Asia would have been a very helpful. I think many people are wondering whether the US really is interested in Asia to the same extent as it was maybe a couple of years ago, whether it's due to Fiscal reasons, whether due to other reasons, I cannot say. But I think there is an effort now amongst the Asian countries, and do we include Australia in this? We have given up the quartet, but I think there is an idea of Australia and the, some of the Asian countries getting together to manage a certain amount of stability as far as relations are, are concerned. I leave it at that, but if, somebody, if we can take it on later, but perhaps the Chinese representative can. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to briefly respond to three of the questions. Uh, first, uh, the question by the Australian uh, gentleman about the, uh, whether the US has lost its puff on the pivot. Um, I don't think so, uh, in the sense that 
uh, you have to look at what's really happening on the ground. Uh, and also, you, because, you know, of course, U.S. is a huge uh, global power. It has all sorts of interests involved in other parts of the world. Of course, sometimes they are much more acute in terms of timing. Therefore, sometimes uh, I mean, political leaders uh, uh, have other issues to deal with on an immediate basis. But as a long-term trend, uh, whether you call it a pivot or a rebalance, uh, we see a definite change in strategy. And that is, I think, uh, as somebody mentioned, it was welcome, but uh, I think it all needs to be accepted and recognized as a trend, a strategic trend, which is very important. Uh, in the same breath, uh, uh, people to, to people by, by Asia, of course, uh, Japan has always been in the Middle East uh, uh, because of the reasons we, you all know. Uh, the, the change is the fact that there are other emerging economies uh, taking interest uh, in getting involved. So yes, uh, if you focus on the economic side, uh, there may be a new developments, but it's only a natural evolution development, and I would not necessarily call it pivot. It's just a reflection of what's happening in East Asia or in the global scene. With respect to the proposal by the Korean president on the multilateral dialogue, uh, uh, I would say, of course, uh, in a situation like this, uh, w where uh, there's so much tension because of maybe a growth pains or uh, uh, whatever teething or whatever the word is, um, we need to uh, talk a lot. Uh, but we need to uh, talk uh, among, between ourselves, among ourselves, uh, in a very uh, calm and objective and, and, and sensitive uh, to other people's interests manner. And we need to have uh, a dialogue. And I think. Uh, uh, our, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to represent the government, but I know that um, Prime Minister Abe is very much keen to have dialogue with all the uh, leaders from the neighboring countries. Thank you. Any other comments from Mr. Yang? Yeah. Uh, uh, my comments are our Australian friends uh, concerning about the U.S. rebalancing, the uncertainty of China's foreign policy, Etc. Uh, I think the world is changing very fast. It is always with uncertainties. To the Chinese, we are puzzled by the Americans. When President Clinton came into power, he changed George W. Bush, the 41th foreign policy. When the son came into power, it called for ABC, uh, anything but Clinton, and then the uh, wife of Clinton came into the State Department and she called change. And then the same president, President Obama came, he changed Madam Secretary into Mr. Secretary and change again. So perhaps we have got used to the changes of the United States, and now we have to think about China, India, and others. And China's attitudes toward the United States, uh, legitimate uh, and the primacy in Asian Pacific region is clear and consistent. And the new Chinese president and uh, President Obama held a very important <coughs> informal summit at the Sunnylands, California, in past June. And both sides have agreed to build out new model of major country relations. The American version is major power. Chinese version is major country because the Americans think power. That's a matter of course. And in China, power means something else, but we have agreed that we should work on the, first of all, no conflict or confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. As to uh, Madam President of ROC, ROK, uh, that means the so uh, called Northeast Asia Peace Initiative. I think 
It is a welcome initiative, and we should work for that. But uh, we have the big trouble with your brother, the North Korea. Uh, and uh, I hope that sooner or later we could solve this problem. But uh, while the problem is over there, we can work on that. We can have the designing. We can have the second track dialogue like this, or one and a half, or even first the track. China and, and uh, uh, ROK have been working very, very well. Uh, and uh, th this is uh, encouraging initiative. The uh, last but not least is the Chinese oil companies in Iraq. Yes, we want to be a nicer place. But uh, these places, the Americans, the Europeans are all there. And to work for oil energy is not a thing. But the thing is, if you only pivoting to oil without anything else. That's not good and a grave mistake. China wants to develop not only resource economic relation, but other than resources too, but that takes time. And uh, I think uh, China is learning and uh, I hope that we can work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lafon. I'm very interested to listen to this discussion. What I see from the business, maybe to add on, uh, on the discussion, are two things which, are, which will be very interesting in the next years to come, is the uh, internationalization of Chinese companies, which is taking a, a, a major role you know, in, the, in the global economy and, 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 and in Europe, I think, but also in Africa. And both Indians and Chinese are extremely present in Africa, which has also an impact on Europe. And the second point, which is very interesting, will be uh, the position of Asia on the climate change debate, how it will evolve, because it's a real global. So uh, I think the debate we have was very much a debate, you know, between Asian, uh, Asian countries, but I think the global issues are also very important. Our time is almost up, so perhaps you can just have one, two minutes to, response. Mr. Jinri. Yes, I just want to ask you the reporter's um, question about uh, Secretary Kerry being Atlantis. Um, but this is a rumor. I heard the rumor that the White, House the White House wants Secretary Kerry to spend all this time in the Middle East so he won't make any mistakes on other parts of the, wor of the world. <laughs> but also, um, uh, the other comment is we had, we had Vice President Biden coming over to Japan, Korea, and China. And President Obama is also scheduled to come to uh, uh, Asia. Of course, this is to make up his trip that he uh, canceled to Brunei, Philippines, and Indonesia. But I think there's a good chance that he will also stop by Korea, Japan, or possibly China. So we'll see you know, if, if that is really, you know, and if he does, and I think he needs to do that to prove his words. Thank you. Mr. Tokunov, just a very brief question. No, I, I just want to comment on your question. Uh, I think that this idea, you, I, I mean, this uh, peace initiative, uh, initiated by President Park, you know, here is a very good one, but it's very important for all of us, the countries located in this area, uh, not to stop at the stage of declaration. You know, he made in the past a lot of declarations. I just want to remind you the Gorbachev declaration made in Krasnoyarsk in late 80s, but uh, after declaration, nothing worked. So let's think about the design of uh, uh, this initiative of, of the implementation of this initiative. I, I managed already the security management system. What we need, the security management system. Of course, including the, uh, our brothers from uh, North Korea uh, who uh, should participate in the creation of this uh, security management system. Thank you. Mr. Noren, and you have a very brief. Yeah, I, just, just a minute. I, I, it's obvious from the discussion that is taking place that there's more in common than, than what divides Asia. I think, or I wonder whether the World Policy Conference as one of its, what should I say, the obiter dicta of the conference could be that the countries of Asia should try and establish the kind of concert of Asia like we had, the concert of Europe, in the 19th century, because I think then the inherent strengths of Asia would, I think, 
help this, this, this continent to really achieve uh, a miracle. It's, it's, not, it's a near miracle today, I think we can. So whether the conference can set the tone for this kind of a concert, bringing together countries of Asia and helping in some way to overcome many of the concerns. Quite a few of them are perceived concerns, not necessarily real, but there are some real concerns also. Between the two, if, by, if the World Policy Conference can come out with a final uh, sort of, as I say, uh, diktat saying that we, we need to create this kind of thing so that Asia's full potential can be realized. That's what I thought. Thank you, Mr. Narayan. And I, I think what you've said is very relevant. We don't have a security mechanism to discuss security concerns in Asia. We have a lot of economic cooperation initiatives uh, in the region. We need to build on that. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a very interesting uh, session, the Asia session, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of Asia. I do tend to believe that perhaps we have more strengths than weaknesses. And going forward, perhaps we should be looking also at forging greater partnerships between Asia and Europe. And in that regard, the negotiations between the European Union and the ASEAN countries for an ASEAN uh, EU FTA would be very apt and timely. Thank you very much.